Hello, everybody, and welcome to the PC Gamer Show. Thanks for the countdown, Evan. Sure. Uh, for October 11th, 2017. Uh, I'm back, finally. I, Yay. In full form. I'm, I've been around, but I've been sort of this, like, frog over here just croaking. Give us your best then. cough, James. <laughs> Is it pretty good? I can't I, fake I, it anymore. I'm not hearing the phlegm, yeah. At, at the very least, I can't fake being sick anymore. Uh, but I'm, I'm here. I'm back um, with me. Evan Lottie, Editor-in-Chief. How you doing, Evan? Hey, good, good. It's that time of year. It is that time of year. We got a lot to talk about. Some crazy stuff going down. And also, Wes, Features hello. Editor. Hello. How hey, you doing? I'm here. I'm good. Yeah? Good to be here. Haven't inhaled too much smoke lately. Yeah. Uh, you know, best of luck to everyone up north. There's the the a Bay Area is on fire. If you yeah. Following the news. As soon as I got better, the air filled with smoke and uh, it started raining ash. And uh, yeah. it's it's been tough for everyone up there. So Not good. No. Anyway, uh, today uh, we got a lot to talk about. We're going to start off with Now Playing, of course, as usual. Uh, then we're going to go into a discussion about a legendary box, the Orange Box, uh, and its 10th anniversary, which we celebrated earlier this week with a kind of a slew of cool articles. Has um, there ever been a better box? Uh, uh, there, uh, there was an Xbox at some point, but I don't know if it compares. Yeah. Yeah, I don't. The, the only like the transparent green Xbox. That was sick. What That's happened? When did that trend oh. die off? That like remember the purple game translucent Boy? plastic. Yeah, I want to so say tight. about two thousand two. Oh man, someone's got to do a retrospective on this stuff because uh, I'll ne that'll never die in my heart. I want a PC with circuit boards showing. Oh, looks bad. <laughs> <It> looks awful. Then <laughs> uh, we're gonna talk about some uh, hmm, slightly more nefarious boxes you might say yes yeah, the exploitative kind of box yeah not, not yeah. xbox exploitation box <laughs> yes that's a good that's a good one there not really um yeah that's so good. there's a lot to talk about with loot boxes they're kind of been blowing up lately every game has them and there's some uh ethical <laughs> kind of uh, issues to discuss around them uh then we're gonna wrap with our usual twitch chat q a so get your questions ready and uh we'll answer them to the best of our ability but anyway what we've been playing what you guys been playing? Anything new? Anything? You know, a game doesn't have loot boxes. What's that? Divinity: Original Sin Two. <laughs> that's a that's a good call. Uh, I don't know if I have much to talk about uh, Divinity wise this week. I've been continuing to play yeah. it. That's pretty much the only PC I've been PC game I've been playing uh, since last week. I've been dabbling in mm -hmm. like I, I got a Super NES Classic, which is already hackable, which I'm excited to Ooh. hack from my PC. Apparently, some of the the custom stuff you have to like do some FTP server stuff to like get files Rad. onto it. Rad. Um, but I'm gonna wait till does the it have a network connection? Sure. Uh, you can connect it to your PC via USB, I guess is the mm. is the process. Oh. I haven't looked into it too closely, huh. um, but I'm, I'm looking forward to to messing around with that hardware a little bit. Um, but yeah, Divinity continues to be pretty great. I think James and I might be around the same point in the game. I've yeah. finished Act One. Uh, where, yeah. you, where you leave yeah. the island of Fort Joy, which is kind of just a giant tutorial area. It's it's truly horrifying. Because I talked to Wes about this, but there's a character. As soon as you like finish that, well, I don't know how long. How many hours did you spend there with your your uh, co-op? A little over twenty. A little over twenty. Yeah, about the same for me. Uh, you, you get off the island, and a character says to you, it, it, basically, "Wow, you're at the beginning of a long journey." and it kind of blows your fucking mind. <laughs> You're like, oh, wait, wait, wait. That wasn't like a third of the game necessarily. But yeah, uh, there's a lot to do. Did you get a... Because when you leave, your quest log kind of lists all the things you, you did not complete. Did you guys kind of... Yeah, I, I wasn't totally clear on that. I got the message mm -hmm. that says, you know, you're not going to be able to complete some quests yeah. if you leave now. I, I saw that, um, but I didn't go back and look real closely right. at what we had and hadn't done. But there were definitely quests we had that were still open mm -hmm. um, that we didn't... That I'm not sure if we could have finished due to killing characters or the way certain things played out um but so yeah we definitely left uh, a mess behind us in fort joy we we killed the majority of the island's inhabitants i think including, really including the civilians yeah well <laughs> no. that's what happens when you get caught pickpocketing i feel like i've heard a lot of people are doing that <laughs> yeah it's 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 easy which is the <laughs> yeah, well the, the sad thing i mean it geez. i felt a little bad about it but it was like well all these people are trying to kill us because we tried to steal from them so we could either just run away and not fight them or we could just slaughter all of them because they're kind of 
uh, they they have no defenses. That seems like a. Cr- I, I don't know. I mean, it seems like a flaw to me as a role player. I want alternate alternative solutions, and I'm guessing. I don't know. I'm guessing you guys aren't playing like mass murderer characters. Uh, yeah, sort of, <laughs> like, like, are you all barbarians or something? Or? Um, I mean, one of us is an undead guy, so I feel like he's probably somewhat leaning towards. Um, but he, no, he has like, a bias, you might I, say. Yeah, I have the I have the red <laughs> prince with us, who's a an aristocrat sort of, so he's not exactly a, a mass murderer. Um, yeah, I don't know. It gives you certain amount, certain amounts of freedom and options when you're d- dealing with quest lines and discussions with characters. But I think it is fairly uh, strict and harsh when it comes to if you get caught doing something, stealing from somebody. Yeah. A lot of times that will just initiate combat. And maybe there's a way to get out of it other than just fleeing the combat. You know, you could probably there might be ways to knock characters out later in the game when you get the right skills or something to to end a combat round without just fleeing because i'm pretty sure if you flee and then come back they'll still want to want to kill you there's uh a system i'm so i was surprised not to see a similar system in this game is uh any of you guys touch torment tides of numenera i year? haven't sadly yeah uh, i mean like so essentially every turn you have in combat you can also choose to spend on dialogue mm. and you can sort of talk yourself out of I think literally every combat scenario you can like the end boss of the game. I, I you know I I I haven't finished it, but I, cool. that that was like a thing I heard a developer say, and I'm totally paraphrasing and probably mm. lying to you, but it uh, it's a possibility. So I mean, that's um, one of the touches people really really love about Undertale, right? Yeah, Where yeah. every combat encounter does not have to end in combat, mm-hmm. you know, as long as you kind of figure out the puzzle to it. But I, yeah, I think Divinity is a little bit more binary mm-hmm. between mm-hmm. now are the parts where you're talking and now are the parts where you're you're fighting. Uh, other than being able to flee from combat. But to be honest, we also haven't really tried to get out of a combat situation with people that we didn't mean to fight with. Like, we'll either reload or we'll kill them. So right. uh, I, I I am actually curious to go in and, and try to see if there are other ways to, to solve that combat. Maybe somebody in chat even knows. Right. How does that work with co-op partners? Is it like the host is the save lord, essentially? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, gotcha. so I'm hosting the game, so I can save and load at will. Gotcha. Um, so a lot of times my friends will be like, can you save? <laughs> like, okay, what's she going to do? I love that hearing like your different people's save anxiety expressed out loud as you play. That's pretty rad. Yeah, so I'm, I'm still having a lot of fun with it. Cool. Great game probably have two months to go two or three months of, of play mm-hmm. but that's fine Jeez. we'll get there in the end wild what about you Evan? still playing cuphead yeah i'm on the second of i believe three islands and um continues to be a delight i think that it's it has the soundtrack of the year and that's saying something because we've already had a lot of good music in 2017 so good i think we'll be debating that uh, as we come, come into our game of the year and stuff of the year discussions. Yeah, I mean, it's it just feels wonderfully dense with art and sound. That sounds obvious, but it, it sort of really reminds me how many kind of untapped aesthetics there are for games. You yeah. know, you think about silent film or, uh, you know, I don't know, Japanese monster movies. I mean, obviously we've had like Godzilla style games and stuff like that, but... Uh, has it been fully explored? I don't know. So it, it, it's been inspiring in that way. I think um, I, I find the level and, and boss, I guess, design really clever in most cases. It, it walks this really fine line between infuriating you and really challenging you and getting you to stretch out your existing skill set in, in a way that's like very quiet. You know, there's no like tool tips on screen. There's no... Uh, you know, hitting you over the head with text mm. or explanation. You have to figure this stuff out. You have, to, you know, you, you encounter this level and you're like, in some cases, you're like, how do I do this? You know, like uh, one that I'm grappling with right now, I can't remember the name of it. There's sort of these different stuff that will ride in like the ceiling and the floor and you have to alternate between them by doing a, what's called a parrying move. Yeah. Where it's you kind j- of like a minecart situation. Yeah, that's a good comparison. Mm. You, you jump and then you hit, you collide with any um, 
pink object on the screen and then you hit the jump button again you parry and it allows you to basically flip between the ceiling and the floor um and i, I had to figure out a couple times i'd go back to the store and say oh i need if i had the chaser weapon type i can run the opposite direction to evade and then that'll allow me to get through this section and stuff like that um so it's doing a great job of just throwing curveballs and you sort of hit a wall you know you hit a wall halfway through or three quarters way through a level you know you go play something else you come back so I'm, I'm also joining that open aspect of it right where it's all it's all sort of terraced or tiered um the first island i found not impossible and, mm-hmm. and, and not not too easy but but like certainly like manageable and things are ramping up now so <laughs> yeah it's been good uh like you james i've been playing shadow of war too yeah why don't we just talk about that right now sure uh shadow of war so how much have you played of it and what are you thinking so far i'm three hours in i guess i'll preface by saying i'm not i don't usually play i don't play a lot of the style of game i played right basically no assassin's creed games i, I don't really like third person action games but I've been playing more stuff with a controller like Cuphead and, and it's been nice. Um, so yeah, I've been enjoying it. I think one of the things that strikes me is how flexible the nemesis system and like the enemies in general are. It's, it's sort of like the system that it it bends instead of breaking, right? Mm. You know, when something goes wrong with it, it's funny or it's, it's interesting or you get an easy win, right? That's not true of a lot of game systems yeah. when, when something's procedural, like, but it goes awry or it's kind of outside the usual parameters. It's often frustrating actually. You know, last night I, I was fighting in, I had this mission where I had to in, infiltrate this little fort. It, it felt like just sort of a, a pretty normal nemesis mission. Um, what I had done actually though, is I had, sent a death threat to one, to one of these guys to, to an orc yeah which i think yeah. you're just like i'm coming basically yeah well yeah so you can you can yeah. you can i think you uh interrogate a worm which is yes. like a, a shitty orc basically they're like a resource yeah. in, in the environment <laughs> to, to get intel on an yeah. enemies find out their weaknesses yeah, yeah they're they're bad orcs <laughs> and so you can you can now send death threats to orcs who are trying to hunt down and you get like a loot bonus or reward bonus uh, but they're yeah. more difficult yeah right? it, le- it levels them up as you yeah. send them a death threat but you get better loot as a reward right so i send one of these to one of these one of these guys talion um, coming what, what? <laughs> <laughs> did you whistle oh <laughs> my god that's so good that's so good wes uh his name was oogle evil eye he was like an archer or something marksman anyway i had to kill 10 of his dudes just like a normal orc dudes right. in this fort area without them raising the alarm. And the alarm is like, if you play Far Cry, like a static thing in the environment that mm. orc, like once you're discovered, orcs will run to, they'll hit it, a bunch of other dudes will swarm in. So I need, not like, I didn't need to make 10 stealth kills. I just need to yeah. get rid of 10 of these guys without the alarm being sounded. So unlike number five and number six, I've been like hitting the guys in the battlements, like picking off the really easy ones. And then I start getting into this hand to hand. It's getting a little, it's getting a little wiry. Like, you know, you're trying to take out these guys as quickly as possible. People are on patrol around you. I'm fighting this guy. And then just like crawling over the battlement wall is another guy. He's like, hey, boy, <laughs> you know, I, I see you're real busy there. Sure looks like an awkward time to, you know, he doesn't actually say this, but like at, at the worst possible time, some like fucking poison lord comes over the over the wall and right. just like and I'm like, try. I'm furiously trying to k- kill this, kill this like basic guy. Um, you know, you have, if you play the style of game or Batman, you know, you have to like whittle them down or execute a certain series of moves mm. to get to like do the execution move or whatever, right? right? And but as soon as he spawns, he, he puts this you know poison indicator down on the ground, like basically I'm gonna poison this whole fucking area. You better move. But <laughs> no. I know that if I move, this guy's gonna get away and like sound the alarm. I'm gonna get mm. like in this battle with this uh new higher level lieutenant or whatever they're called captains i guess yeah anyway so he, he you know he runs to sound the alarm i chase him down i hit him in the head with an arrow it's very dramatic and like i sort of escape away in the fort um and eventually i i hit like one of the fireplaces or something to mm-hmm. or uh, campfires to detonate it and, and right. kill a bunch of guys um, but I get in a rooftop and I get another dude just like <laughs> come, comes out of fucking nowhere. Is the poison guy still loitering around? Somewhere? Oh yeah. He's in there somewhere. Uh, who knows? And, and, and in this mix, you know, now the, I, I've, what, what the mission was is you had to kill 10 of these guys to draw out and like, cause you, to draw out the captain, mm-hmm. um, the Google evil, evil eye guy that I was actually after. So 
Now I've got him somewhere in the environment shooting arrows at me. I've got the poison guy lobbing stuff at me, kind of lurking around. And I've got this new like warrior guy that just like stumbles in. Um, I feel like I'm fucking speed dating orcs <laughs> at this point, you know? <laughs> so, but, but, he, but the new guy, the third guy that stumbles in, he's like super low level. So I just like, I, I take him down in like 30 seconds on a rooftop, I kick him off the rooftop. It feels nice. super great. And, um, yeah, like, I guess that's that's what I'm talking about. Where it, it was it was very overwhelming and it felt kind of unfair to some extent. But somehow the system figured out that like this was the right amount of difficulty or this would be interesting to me. Mm-hmm. You know, judging how successful I was being, or I'm not sure you know what variables it's really looking at. But uh, it, it it's fun when it hands you a really clumsy, shitty orc <laughs> that you just gut in ten seconds because you're yeah. like the the narrative of that is. I'm really powerful. I have this fucking crazy elf god inside me mm-hmm. that makes rings. <laughs> and, <laughs> Couple of them. And, um, you know, of course I'm just going to gut this level of a guy. Or when it throws, you know, three guys at me at once in this, like, really un- unpredictable situation, that's fun, too. So I think it's a great sign that they've elevated that system and that they've handled it well when both end of this, ends of the spectrum, easy and hard and in between, are all really fun for me. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, my thoughts uh, pretty much mirror yours. It's, the, I, I would say, it, it feel it, it feels like a really great system embedded mm-hmm. in a, like I don't know, a, a an overall structure that doesn't quite suit it, because the map is filled with sort of tiny little tasks, open world tasks, uh, mini missions like collectibles, yada yada, and you're gonna traverse these these you know maps plenty of times to collect some of that stuff and level up and yada yada get your currency and if you want spend it on loot boxes. So all that feels pretty cookie cutter. Yeah, world. and and, and there, so there are towers that you have to climb up yeah. to purify and when you do so you have to like use a seeing eyeglass practically to like find stuff in the environment that becomes markers that you seek out later. Like Great. It, it it's very gameplay loopy. It's very mm-hmm. video gamey. Uh, yeah. to the extreme. And it, it it's it's it makes com- I don't know the, the really cool uh, Nemesis system makes completing some of those tasks like more tedious than they should be, even though what's happening to you is exciting. Uh, if you're, I don't know, there was several times I was trying to complete, you know, just get to a collectible or get to a a uh, whatever they called uh, their memories, where you go back and relive these memories from the past, and like you know, you can get medals and shit, like hanging out with your wife. <laughs> Well, you, usually <laughs> you're playing as the elven guy. Yeah, what's well, his name? I it's, forgot. It's not Celebr- uh, Celebrindor. That's not Celebrimbor. I don't know. <laughs> Tol- Tolkien names, man. You play as a, a young, strapping elf. Mom Bombadil. Mom Bombadil. <laughs> Mom Bombadil. Yeah, we got an article for you at PCGamer.com if you want to read it. Uh, maybe I'll post it in chat. But, um, uh, yeah, I don't know. Some of that stuff it just like feels kind of necessary, or I mean like bolted on to appease, you know, I don't know, to make a bullet point because it's kind of hard to sell or this really unique system on its own. I think it's telling, Um, though, that if you look at what people are talking about with this game on Twitter or whatever, they're... It's always about all oh, this guy that I killed three times, or this guy with the, the goofy name or Definitely. attributes or whatever. Is always about the characters, right? Yeah. No one's like, oh man, it was so cool when I climbed that tower and <laughs> spotted thirty-seven <laughs> different collectibles scattered around this map area. Like, yeah. that's not the interesting thing. Definitely, about that game. and, and I, like even uh, I don't know, three hours in, I've had s- several orc encounters that are just funny or unique or interesting to me like pug the friendly keeps coming back pug, uh, th- they've added so many different kinds your of friends yeah it, it really feels like the the first game i sort of felt like i saw every orc and heard every line you know by the time i was done uh, i don't really know how far their added dialogue and personality and tribes and all those variables are gonna like how well worn they're gonna get by the end but feels so much more diverse this time um <laughs> pug the friendly is uh, a a friendly guy he's like he just like i meet him and that 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 moment when it locks onto the orc and like introduces the captain and they say their little bit you know it, typically you're, you're waiting to get threatened or for them to just go and you know, wave their weapon in the air but he's just like how about we just talk how about parlay you know uh, let's just chill uh, we don't gotta do this we're gonna i killed him obviously like cut his arm off and then cut his leg off and he was very Why'd much you have to drag it out <laughs> I, I thought he was dead 
two hours later, he just like shows up again, like an unwilling participant in the nemesis system. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like it was Hunt an ambush. And like his destiny. He said, it's, it's an ambush. And he says to me, oh, my God, all I feel is pain. My head, my head, my head. Please kill me now. I kill him again. Two hours later, he comes back and he just like at that point, <laughs> he's covered in bandages and he's like got a stump arm and like his face is oh you my know God. and i kill him again and he just cries it's it i that alone to me is worth all the extra nonsense because yeah as much as i you know i, I can criticize that stuff it, it's really not most of it is not necessary to proceed and participate and, all the game is bloated for yeah, sure yeah. i mean even three hours in it's noticeable um yeah. and 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 I even I have not even unlocked Act Two, yeah. which is when you start building your own kind of army of these, mm. I guess, enslaved as they call it, orcs yeah. that you've brought over your side and like join you in siege battles and have other functions. I guess I haven't gotten there either, and I, you know, it's a case of you know in Dragon Age Inquisition that first big area where people just stayed and got bored of the game. I, I feel like this game has. A similar problem in that I just keep wandering the map and trying to kill orcs and yeah. take over stuff, and I don't even have the ability to like convert them yet. And uh, but either way, I'm enjoying. It. You know? I just really, you know, it, it's something that our review really reflected. Yeah. Um, you know, Andy Kelly, who wrote a great review, sort of said, you know, it, it's a great action game. Mm -hmm. The Nemesis system it, it continues to be great. It's the best thing about that game. But God, like tone it down you know like yeah. less is more to some extent I, and i really wonder what shadow oh, i keep trying to say wardor god <laughs> me too it's so intuitive everyone does <laughs> yeah. i, I, I want to know what this game would be like if instead of having freaking 12 or whatever it is captains per region yeah right oh my god it's like lot. Why not just like a couple and you actually remember their names and mm -hmm. they were they were like very unique. Like, yes, there's a lot of fun to the notion of like you're spinning this wheel and what kind of weird orc archer or bruiser or, you know, a uh, spear thrower or, you know, whatever am I going to get? Uh, and, and the game is sort of generating something that's very unique to you. You have ownership over that. But do you really remember the third orc that you fought or the 13th or, you know, number... 75 yeah. like it's aiming to be endless right that's the yeah that's the goal especially yeah. and what we hear right. about the end game especially seems to be trying to make the orcs sort of this end the the uh siege uh mode like a persistent sort of thing you can play almost forever uh or at least like mm. hours and hours and hours and hours but i think that's silly yeah it's i don't know i'd rather have a concise memorable experience rather than i don't know you chew through i chewed through probably like 20 orcs in my first hour yeah. and a half, two hours. <laughs> and, and I'm yeah. pretty unimpressed by the story stuff so far. Oh, it's, okay. It's pretty the, the cut scenes are a huge upgrade. Yeah. You know, the, the motion capture, the voice acting is all really nice. Um, the, the character assets are nice, even though, uh, t what God, Talion doesn't, doesn't like recapture your, um, costume changes, you know, as you equip yeah. new gear, it, it all looks the same in the cut scenes, which is, I find really annoying. Mm -hmm. But I don't know. I'm just not invested in Lord of the Rings. I, you know, maybe I'm not the target audience for this sort of thing. But I find Talion a r basically unlikable, super serious guy with a basically unlikable, super serious ghost inside of him that sometimes <laughs> comes out of him. I mean, there's there's a both like super dour characters who have both separately died. <laughs> you know, they're like undead, to buy one get one free anti heroes or whatever. And they should play up his undeadness. Like he should be. What if Talion was like the orcs, where every time you died in the game, you get like you come back, but you're all fucked up, and like you have to get your arms sewn back on, and by the end of the game, you're just like zombie Talion. Just I'm into it. Wes. Pieces, pieces falling off all the time, and your face is all scarred up. He, he's just so molded out of the you know. Commander Shepard, super yeah. serious Space Marine stuff that we've seen over the past 10 years. And I'm tired of it, you know? I agree. I, I would love to have this character crack a joke, you know? the and, and what ends up happening, of course, is these orcs end up being the most fun, comical, playful, you know, well-rounded in, in, in little moments. You know, we actually found out, like, as a group they are, 
we, we found out an hour ago that there's another special yeah. orc type <laughs> or or just in like custom character and there may be more of these i'm, I'm sort of hoping that there are I'm very excited to find I, out i think we'll find out this week or, or or next week there's one that sings to you he just shows up with a loot and fights you with his loot yeah <laughs> and kills you with yeah. he sings a song about killing you and stuff yeah it's, yeah so like as he's grappling with you in that sort of canned animation he's singing you a song about your death and then he com- comes back i guess uh, god amazing. yeah i mean it's such a strange it's so s- jarring going back and forth between like the the story missions and just you know wandering the world and hearing the the orc chatter it's really funny and, and they're they're all goofy and a lot of them are like i some of the incidental, incidental chatter I heard was they were like debating the popularity of certain last names and like how they were overused. Like, oh, I gouge you. Everyone has I gouge you now. <laughs> you got to go with this to stay in vogue. You know, like, like that's, that's, it's so weird going from great. that kind of levity to, uh, I got to avenge my wife and my son still, I guess. And a ghost that's angry at some lore things that I don't quite understand anymore. And, there's such a great opportunity for them to be foil characters and and bounce off one another, but I don't know. It's oh, yeah, and, and here's Gollum again yeah. for some reason. Yeah, the time to Gollum, I was like, what? Really? <laughs> uh, it, it surprised me. And I guess they're again in 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 the Lord of the Rings mythos, Gollum and she, Shelob, Shelob, Shelob are very important, and that's sort of portrayed here in in. in I don't know. That feels uh, very much like a publisher thing. To yeah, me. Like we Bingo. we have the rights to to these characters and like can't forget about Gollum. Can't let anybody forget Gollum for five minutes. You know? I think he's got to show up in in marketing or something <laughs> like to you know. It, it just it's just good to have if you're trying to sell this thing. I guess I feel like I would off. I would trade all that stuff definitely literally all of it for more interesting emergent circumstances like a dude with a loot who shows up to fight you. Yeah, you know more of that. They should have gotten yeah. rid of uh, Talion and just had Viggo Mortensen come in <laughs> and just reprise Aragorn and do do well. all the voice acting and mocap. I mean, the the characters look identical basically, so you would just get you know Viggo Mortensen actually being a good actor and bringing some humor to it. I, I don't know if Chad is urging us to talk about the loot box situation in this game. I don't know if you want to move on. Yeah, I think it's wanna... it's a nice segue uh, sure. because I mean this game like. Many other games coming out now mm-hmm. have loot boxes. Oh, that's a that's a problem for a lot of people, rightfully so. Is it, James? Can you, can you break this down for us, uh, uh, Evan? Like, what what's going on lately? Why is this trend grabbing hold, and are they a problem? What can be done about it? Why do they exist? Yeah, well, I don't know. It, it, it's not any special moment. I, I think there's sort of a a number of things that are making it feel like it's really intense right now. Mm-hmm. I think it it the fact is like it's October. A lot of big games released in October, a lot of games from big publishers who will have noticed, for example, that Activision made $3.6 billion from just in-game transactions last year. So folks like Warner Brothers, folks like 2K with NBA 2K18, folks like EA with Battlefront, like those are the folks that are going to most capitalize on a big profitable trend in the gaming industry. Like, what do you expect them to do, right? Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, I, I guess we should, I, I sort of feel the need to clarify, um, sh- middle earth, uh, for, oh, sure. Right? Absolutely. So like, cause there was a lot of, you know, there's, it's been like a huge point of discussion over the past week. I feel like there's actually been a lot of misinformation about how the system works. Mm-hmm. People were saying like, Oh, you like, you can only get the good ending if you, spend money to unlock like legendary orcs in these boxes and stuff which is total bullshit um first of all in my experience and so the you know i I think the experience of our peers which is more valuable they finished the game i haven't finished it you haven't finished it you know they claim you do not need to spend a penny in this game to progress to have fun to finish it period you know And, and these are folks that we really really trust either that used to work with us or you know they're just doing the same job we have so that's worth saying. Um, Middle Earth has two types of boxes, basically. Mm-hmm. You have what, like loot boxes? I think war chests. Loot chests and war chests. Yes. So, so loot chests are equipment your armor, your swords, your bow, uh, your cloak, I guess, which gives you stealth or whatever. So, yeah, while you're fighting enemies, you, you kill captains and you have a chance to get like epic, legendary, whatever swords with all these benefits. You can level them up just like 
kind of any other game. You can buy chests, and there are three tiers of each chest. There's like silver, gold, and mithril or whatever. Yeah. I'm just going to say mithril. I don't know why I pronounce it like stupid li- licensed way. Mithril. I think that's what they say. Yeah, it is probably. Anywho, so my understanding is that the two the two upper tiers, gold and mithril, are cash, mm-hmm. and the lower tier, silver, is not. So... Obviously, you can still sort of spend your in-game currency or whatever. You can just hit, literally hit start, go to a market, and buy this stuff and have it instantly. Um, so on the surface, you, you can if you want to buy these crates, you can do it with the in-game currency that you accrue, um, but, or you can spend cash to get more of them. And the, and the war chests, unlike the loot chests, are to unlock um, what the, the orcs themselves, mm-hmm. like these, these special... Mm-hmm. Orc captains that you can bring on your side, bring to sieges. They have their own unique act- attributes and strengths and weaknesses and stuff like that. Um, and, and of course, yeah, if you pay cash, you have like a higher chance or like a greater speed at which you can get the best ones, probably. So that's kind of the system in a nutshell. But there's also stuff in there that actually I, I was surprised other folks didn't call out. Um, you can what? You can get a two-hour XP boost. You can spend yeah. money to just get a two-hour XP boost in a single-player so weird a- RPG. That's so grating, you know. And, and okay, to be fair, you know, I, I played three hours. I feel like I've leveled up really quickly. I feel like it's been fine. Maybe that changes. Same, Maybe it plat- plateaus. I don't know how kind of how that plays out as a bell curve or whatever. But um, what does that say about the design of the game? Like even so, if you're cynical, you're gonna say like, oh, they made gaining experience really right. slow and shitty, so that you want to buy that. Yeah. I, I would would not guess that that's what they did, right? I would guess that they tuned the experience curve to be what they thought was the best experience for this game for the estimated amount of time you're going to put into it. So then what does this item do to that very carefully designed, you know, experience gain curve that very a very talented group of dozens of designers spent years working on is just saying or pay five bucks and you can do it twice as fast. And the fact that it's two hours, it's a two hour booster, you know, like <laughs> a temporary booster in a single player. So you just game. go grind killing uh, orcs for two hours. It's it's also worth noting that if you sign up for the WB mailing list or something, you get yeah. a permanent 3% experience boost, which is also just kind of really, yeah, it's right on the front wow. uh, around the main menu. I missed that. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I mean, honestly, that stuff is, at least as gross, if not grosser to me than the loot boxes, yeah. which, yeah. okay, having loot boxes in a single player game that you can pay for, uncomfortable to be sure. But the whole notion of paying for more experience points in a single player game, that's just so bizarre to me. I don't know. I, I would, I would never do that. And I really want to talk to someone who, who is, who feel, it's, who feels compelled to do that. It's like, one of those things that like it, it started in mobile games and was yeah. an outlier for a while. And then, as it's now been, you know, what, eight years or something since we've kind of been playing iPhone games, it's become part of the language that people understand, and that has gradually just seeped it, its way into being like, well, people get this now. Why not just put yeah. it in this other yeah. thing? Without getting too political, it, it like follows this trend that I feel like a lot of industries do with with capitalism. It's like, as things exist longer, we, you know, these companies figure out how to exploit them better over mm-hmm. time, right? And And they... Because Warner Brothers, EA, Activision, these are all like publicly held companies that have a responsibility to their shareholders to earn growth. Even if they made record profits in 2016, Gotta make more which, in which, many, which many of these companies did. Look at Overwatch, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, Activision bought King, one of the biggest mobile game companies in the world last year, I believe. Um, they have a responsibility, you know, if they earn a, a hundred billion dollars one year, you know, they have to earn $200 billion next year. They have to just arbitrarily grow at every year, regardless of what they're working on, basically every quarter, even. Um, and, and that's what leads to, you know, systems like this that are just incongruous, make no sense uh, within the confines of the genre and, and much of the design of the game, because, you know, like the airline industry, well, oh, we can charge people for bags. Let's do that. Oh, we can charge people for their seat and what seat they choose. We can do that. Like, or well, we can create all these tiers of when you get onto the plane. Like, you yeah. know, it, it's just getting really granular and, and like, you know, compressing it down and down further to uh, anything they can. So, 
Yeah. I mean, but again, I don't think this is like sort of an outbreak of, of bad actors. I th again, I, th mm -hmm. I think it's simply, it's October. Yeah. This is when ga like big games come out of this type and it, it's time for another Battlefront. It's time for another Shadow of War. It's time for another NBA 2K18. And they happen to be following the biggest trend in gaming. Yeah. I mean, and uh, loot boxes are an easy sort of symbol to see and recognize instantly uh mm -hmm. but you know microtransactions were introduced at relatively the same pace and other you know trends happen in you know the same pace because like you said release season it's all coming out so it's it's such a bummer to me also on kind of just like a wider level that like in-game currency is such a like known and ubiquitous thing now right like yeah. if you thought about if you said in-game currency to me 10 years ago i would have been like oh gold. gil in final <laughs> fantasy gold or whatever right and like maybe yeah. the word gold is now used in interchangeably but it's like all of these games have to have these bolted on meta layers of purchases or unlocks or whatever that we've come to just see as totally natural because they're so common now but it's it's like i don't maybe not all i don't want all my games to have in-game currency that's not just like the shit you use at the rpg store to buy a new piece of armor yeah you know? yeah so we published a, a long discussion piece on our site about this that you can re read and dig into and really grapple with our arguments i think it's fair to say all of us come down on the on the on the side that is against loot boxes in, in, and, including and, some people on staff who have bought plenty yeah. right mm -hmm. oh mm -hmm. i'm i'm one of them Counter-Strike. Yeah. Counter-Strike, Mass Effect multiplayer, Overwatch. Yeah, Overwatch. for sure. But, but Wes, I think one of the best points that was made in, in the story made by you um, was just this notion that loot boxes m at, create this kind of homogenous game design across varying kinds of games and, and how unpleasantly samey that is, right? Yeah. So you know, you, 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 I'll let you dig into it, but the notion that like reward systems are intentionally unique per game, you know, uh, whether it's points or levels or, you know, you're earning actual items and loot that you're equipping characters like that can and, and should vary based on uh, the progression of a game, how long it is, sort of its heritage, the genre and stuff like that. And, and instead, we're seeing this, like you're saying, like bolted on symmetrical. OK, I've got to find a way to, you know, in, within the gameplay loop, within, you know, th that arc of combat or progression the player has to earn this box thing that has random stuff in it and i have to make that like buyable as well yeah i mean g going back to something i actually talked about on the podcast last week i brought up goldeneye the old n64 game and mm. how much i delighted in yeah. the ways you would unlock uh either new maps in that game or like special modes you know big head mode paint uh, paintball that kind of stuff mm -hmm. uh was all based on completing missions in kind of specific ways at specific difficulty levels or whatever think about like super smash brothers where in super smash brothers melee you could just unlock characters mm -hmm. by playing a bunch i think but you could also do it by like finishing a relay race level with like a two in the second column or something and there were these like very kind of bizarre ways to do that stuff and yeah you would look it up online and then like excitedly do it but the point was those are totally unique to those games they wouldn't work the same way across a bunch of games if you tried to apply that system to everything it just wouldn't make sense but it was so fun and it still is so fun when you find a new game and you start playing it and you don't know how everything works in that game you don't know the limits of what your character's abilities are but you also don't know the limits of just how all the systems interact with each other. And if you have something like loot boxes, you go into that new world knowing, okay, I don't know what the story setting of this place is. I don't know like what the weapons are, but I do know that the way either powers or aesthetic elements or some component like that, I know exactly how it's going to be rewarded. I know I'm going to get either a certain amount of in-game currency that I can spend on these things, or I know that I can bypass that by spending X amount of money. I know that I'm not going to unlock them in this other way because they're all going to come through this random drop chance. And that's just, it's just boring, honestly. And like, it's, it's boring and it means a lot of really talented designers out there aren't going to be able to push some new idea they have because they're going to go, well, we have to 
evolve our major mechanics around this system that is already kind of written out for us, right? They have to bolt that in there and then work around it. Yeah, yeah. And, and, it, and it starts to overshadow intrinsic rewards, I think, mm. right? You know, so think just all you have to do is think about the previous Middle Earth game. Yeah. You know, yeah. a game that did not have loot boxes and now sort of examine the fact that, okay, the game is explicitly defining, well, there's actually like these gems as well in the game now. And like, mm-hmm. so you have like all these varieties of explicit, you know, ext- extrinsic rewards almost within the game, right? Like you have, you, you kill an arc captain and you can get a new item. You can get a new gem to slot into that item and give it a bonus. You can get some currency and, you know, you can get these loot boxes as well or currency that can be spent on the loot boxes. Um, and I feel like because, because are there all like all this, this ball of extrinsic rewards, it sort of prevents me from really, it just sort of gets in, it muddles the experience of like the actual reward, which is having this fun, engaging fight defeating this guy and like the story that comes out of it like that's the reason i play that game that's yeah. the actual literally rewarding aspect of it. it 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 completely devalues what it means to capture an orc or defeat an orc i mean like it, in shadow of war for example because uh, you get one free crate of orcs and the moment i opened that crate and saw three unique you know uh, orcs pop out i was like what the fuck is the point of, like what are you trying to do it this like chops this game in the achilles uh, by devaluing these things that you're trying to build up as like unique, yes, you know, creatures as items, as be, objects to be, an end. Because in that case, you have no personal history with those no, characters. No. They're they're springing out of this like non diegetic box yeah. that, that exists, sort of inside and outside of the game. And now they're just yours. They're loyal to you instantly by some weird magical, mm-hmm. you know property outs- that exists outside the game you, you don't have this sort of fun of oh I, f- I found this guy in this region of the world i fought him and then i used this ability to turn him onto my side because i really liked you know he he like killed me one time and i, re- I really wanted to like recruit him mm-hmm. like that is cut out of the game at that point like the the fun and value of that experience it, and you know it speaks to how generic this idea is that it's always a crate or like cards of some <laughs> right. kind. Like, okay, Star Wars For, Battle- Fortnite did pinatas, which is cool. Okay, so yeah. that's good, right? It, it's not always, but like the vast majority of the time, you look yeah. at like Star Wars Battlefront Two. It's it's so Star bad. Wars. Like, do anything with it, right? <laughs> like, make it R two D two. Like, stuff pops out of his body, and that's you know that's your loot or whatever. Like yeah. in in the division right like it's this po- post-apocalyptic setting why does it just have to be like an ammo crate why it, you know in in a game with that's gun based why can't your gun like shoot out some crazy bullets and the bullets are your loot like let it be anything right, right. other than just a box that you open up right there it's really lazily themed like yeah. like mm-hmm. like you're saying um I mean, and it's, it's, it's almost like they don't think that people they're like okay people get what loot boxes are but if we make it a loot pinata they might not understand right like it's a pretty understandable concept things come out of the thing you pay money for we can figure it out you don't have mm-hmm. to make it a literal box every time so one of the things that came up in our discussion on the site was okay are, are we are we opposed to loot crates loot boxes loot pinatas whatever uniformly across the board because and what is it about right now right Mm -hmm. because okay these have existed for a long time now you know team fortress introduced them in 2009 or 10 yeah and the trading card games have like toyed with kind of the same ideas for as long as we've been collecting those magic and and pokemon so they're the 90s yeah yeah yeah. earlier a familiar concept but for sure and and not to say that you know when tf2 (laughs) certainly when tf2 introduced uh crafting and the whole item economy stuff and even had like buyable items Mm -hmm. at the outset there was a lot of uproar there's a lot of people confused upset you know concerned about like what this meant for the future of the game competitively and all this sort of thing that you had to get these weapons in order to have this ability in game and stuff like that um so yeah like why all the outrage now and separately bigger question i guess where do we draw the line you know like are like what are some examples of acceptable loot boxes i guess if that exists i I think like uh, 
in line with what Wes is saying is if it is from the ground like the ground up the game is designed to fit this reward system and 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 make this reward system makes sense within it uh i overwatch is maybe an example of that um it's not perfect by any means but Mm -hmm. purely cosmetic you're playing everyone's sort of playing the same modes uh and the reward system is just keep playing and get better at the game to you know get more ways to express your character and that's simple enough to be fine to me the the Um, cosmetic thing is a big part of it for me i mean It still does not solve my criticism and my disappointment that you start a new game and you already know this big part of it has been colored in, right? But at least in a game like Overwatch, they are completely irrelevant Mm -hmm. to the play experience beyond, like, your your aesthetic tastes, right? And I think that's been a, a slow change through games where it was all about aesthetics for a long time and then it's slowly more and more games started looping it in to, to other things yeah. and that that's like a, a change in games period that has bothered me for a long time like the the reason i haven't enjoyed a lot of games that chased the co- call of duty multiplayer popularity was because they went back to the rewards like you're saying and stopped making the reward playing the game or being better at the game and they made the reward we're going to give you points and bells and (laughs) chimes and you know pop-ups on your screen for every little thing you do and thankfully i think some games have started to realize like oh it's actually really refreshing to not do what you know supposedly we recruit all this knowledge of like this is good design we're rewarding the player and then you get a game like doom a couple years ago that comes out and is like what if we didn't have reloading and we didn't have like all of this stuff and we went back to the way this game basically was designed 20 years ago actually it's still great like Mm -hmm. it's it's okay you didn't have to do this 20 years of accrued knowledge and just cram it all into the game it still worked if you do it this old way you know and just let people play it yeah you know one of the things bo brought up in the article he's not here of course um but he taught, he sort of identified for him personally what, what he sees as three cardinal rules of, of <laughs> boxes in terms of what's acceptable and what's not. So he says that they should only exist in multiplayer games. I'm with you on that. Mm-hmm. All loot should be cosmetic. I think, you know, there might be a, a couple of exceptions here or there. Uh, you could earn stuff that's like slightly non-cosmetic. Um, I mean, Fortnite gives you a lot of, I mean, for, you could criticize Fortnite a lot for... Uh, yeah. just the raw quantity of weird stuff that you have to earn and, and whatnot. But I think like the fact that you have like a base in Fortnite, mm-hmm. I think that's a, a decent way of managing like how you upgrade that base, how you fill it full of stuff um, that has like a gameplay function mm-hmm. anyway. And, and he also says that, you know, loot boxes or everything in them can also be obtained through non-monetary means. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know. I'm fine with like super legendary crazy skins being mm-hmm. cash only or whatever. I know a lot of games uh, have done that. That doesn't really bother me because I don't feel a particular attraction to them. But yeah, I, I think those are good guidelines. I think multiplayer only is probably the, the biggest one. You know, I, I don't think there's any any cause for paid loot boxes yeah. in, in a single player game. Like if it makes sense in your single player game, like you're a pirate or something and you're literally bringing home crates of <laughs> in the chests of gold that have a variety of randomized things in them. Like, cool. Maybe that's like the, the right reward loop for that game. But, um, yeah, I, I find it especially distasteful and in games, I think this is mostly <laughs> multiplayer, but there might be a single player game that does this where you get the box, you get this object that it, kind of gives you in the game and says like this is yours you have found this but then you have to to buy a key or whatever yeah. form of thing to open the box because that's just blatantly exploitative they're saying like we're giving you this but you get taste yeah well that's what battlegrounds has done you know it's, it's they're really following the team fortress 2 dota and counter-strike uh, methodology there where oh here's this crate gosh uh sh- you know don't let it go to waste oh now you got all these crates and all you need to give us is two two bucks fifty cents and let you open them it, they could contain all these different things i yeah. mean at, at least though most most if not all of those are purely aesthetic right in, in tf2 oh. there's non-aesthetic items and crates 
Correct. But for the most part, it's skins and, and stuff. So at least you can ignore it. I hope it stays that way. I hope the trend doesn't go more and more towards unlocking actual important things with gameplay implications. I would I would attach an addendum to, uh, I think, rule three, the mon- non-monetary means rule, and say that the means of uh, obtaining these items that are in loot boxes, uh, the non-monetary means is at least interesting or also unique and something interesting uh that you can uh, engage with and decode in in some way like i don't know because one example is uh destiny 2 which is not out yet but uh, many of us on staff yeah in like two weeks or something uh, and a lot of pc players will discover these things for themselves and probably be angry and upset about them like we are is uh, the non-monetary means for uh earning things is just you know earning more XP and playing the game and eventually hitting a tier to get a single box. Um, and that works in some games, I suppose, but uh, I don't feel like I'm being challenged to play a certain way or being encouraged to uh, try out a different mode or try out a different weapon type or to or being taught through cues to play in a certain way. Uh, I just have to keep kind of noodling around until I a bar fills up and then I get the the box that the money people get too, uh, and inside there are some really cool things. You know, why can't a sparrow or a, a shader or some kind of cosmetic thing be, you know, locked behind a uh, get, you know, something as simple as like an achievement, get ten headshots with this weapon on this map or or something like that. I think uh, a game with a glut of achievements that really sort of pushed me to play in interesting ways was Team Fortress Two where it's just absurd amount of weird kind of uh, personal milestones. Um, Mm -hmm. And they didn't really like amount to much in terms of extrinsic value, but intrinsically I I had this sort of like, uh, I knew to myself that I had done these cool things and I had explored every sort of corner of this game. And uh, I think putting a little carrot on the stick, uh, you know, for a lot of players to explore the corners of every game uh, to you know, show that they've done this unique thing is still super valuable. Um, so I don't know. I non-monetary means is like so wishy-washy to me, and and a an XP bar just rarely is enough for that. But sure, yeah. I think it goes back to the the sameness. That's like yeah, exactly. These three rules, maybe they're good guidelines, but they're not. Again, they're not a one size fits all thing. Yeah. And I'm sure there's a way you could make a single player game with loot boxes in it where it doesn't feel just like shitty and crammed in, Mm -hmm. but you have to do it differently. You have to be creative about it. You can't just take this exact blueprint that's been done in a hundred games and just put it in there and expect it to be good. Come up with a creative way to do it and then I'll, I'll buy your loot box. Well, we're not gonna we're not gonna solve this in one sitting, and I have a feeling it's gonna continue to be a discussion as Absolutely. as more of these games roll around. I, so. know, I think we fixed it. Oh, we did it. We solved. Oh, we hey, solved yeah. loot boxes. Give us a call, um, WB Bungie. We're, we're here for you. So, you know, let's let's bring it up in, in the Q and A at the end of the show here. Yeah, if you guys want to talk about it more, but I want to make sure we give ourselves a chance to tip our hats yes. collectively to another another box, the orange box. <laughs> a great box. You guys remember this box? A very good box. A good and uh, nice box that respects our wallets. I played this box on the Xbox 360. I'm sad to say. (laughs) Box inside a box. Wow. Yeah, so this came out uh, 10 years ago. There was some debate over the 9th or the 10th midnight release, yada, yada, physical versus digital. But uh, 10 years ago, approximately, Valve released a a bundle of games featuring Half-Life 2, Half-Life 2 Episode 1, Half-Life 2 Episode 2, Portal, and Team Fortress 2. Now, that was $60. Think about that today. Like, that kind of... Yeah, I mean, pe- is- okay, people say that, and I've seen a lot of comments like <laughs> oh, that. No. You're well, sure. And I'm, and I'm honestly like, $60 for three games? That's a bad deal today. <laughs> I suppose <laughs> you know? I suppose my, like... Uh, I pay $70 in, a hum- $7 in a Humble Bundle, and I get, like, 12 things. When I, when I consider the value proposition, I imagine, I'm like, well fucking half-life games and portal like yeah I, these these have bloated value in my mind and, and sort of like that have accrued totally. value over time for me yeah. so reflecting on that as a thing it's like you know that was 60 dollars. it's like well fucking a that's really cool um I mean, team fortress 2 was a pretty huge deal that that yeah. existed period right like people were were kind of yeah 
so it was one of those games that the sequel was so long in coming that most people just had given up on it ever happening. It was like nine years or something since yes. Team Fortress Classic. Yep. So that that alone was kind of shocking. And then the fact that Portal turned out to be such a phenomenon, I think, imbued that that box with a lot of value. It com- I mean, the games complement each other perfectly, right? I mean, because uh, certainly they're all first person, I guess. You know, that's that's maybe a big point of overlap, but... You've got a a, a, bind, a mind-bending, immersive, innovative style of game, you know, created by students essentially that Valve <laughs> brought in and, and 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 worked on with. So you've got this like really fascinating experimental project, and then you've got a huge budget, multi, you know, cam- like campaign, like one of the biggest, you know franchises in fps history yeah, the, cu- the culmination of that and obviously you've got this like really playful spy fi like 1968 <laughs> uh multiplayer game that would end up becoming like one of the most innovative and interesting multiplayer games of all time so wow yeah it's it's crazy to think about um and sort of i don't know I, reflecting on on these games is 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 interesting to me because i i wonder where do you see the presence of these games today and you wrote about team fortress 2 and i think you have a lot of history with shooters so can you kind of talk about like where you th- you see its presence today and like <laughs> its web of influence uh, yeah 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 well loot boxes we talked yeah, 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 we obviously. talked about that that's thanks the, tf2 that's the cynical <laughs> you fucked us you know, that's, i mean honestly if you want to get really cynical about it you know okay team fortress 2's biggest innovation w- was storytelling and its characters right you know before okay think about all the great multiplayer shooters that preceded TF2. Battlefield, Call of Duty, Quake, Unreal Tournament, Counter-Strike, Rainbow Six. None of those games even tried, even attempted to like tell stories in multiplayer. Apart from, I don't know, like Rainbow Six missions, I guess, which have sort of a framing and maybe some dialogue. Uh, You know, the location is a little more important and stuff like that. But, in Unreal Tournament, the characters would sometimes yell, like, eat shit after they kill you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, God, I, I always think about the various avatars of ar- arena shooters and how, like, completely discordant and random they were. There's the robot guy, the lizard guy, they were like, the mercenary guy. Yeah. They're utterly meaningless, you know, just like, hey, art director, like, come up with some cool-looking futuristic characters. Yep. Characters with really just skins. So... I mean, up until TF2 in 2007 in the orange box, it was just decided that, oh, story is where what single player campaigns are for. That's where mm-hmm. that happens. Mm-hmm. And multiplayer is where you go and play with your friends and it's social and competitive, like church and state, right? <laughs> you know, like <laughs> you can't mix, you can't, it, no. it just doesn't work. And, um, and, and, and TF2 starting on this track really kind of began with, what you know looking back on it today it seems like the most simple system we see games like overwatch have embraced it in a big way but this um you know this sort of pool of triggered situational dialogue that each character would have in tf2 where okay if i'm a scout dominating a heavy i'm going to comment on his weight like i have a specific voice line that says that if i kill a heavy four times in a row without him killing me and you know, what would happen was over playing, you know, hundreds of hours or dozens of maps, however much you played TF2, you sort of had this image filled in with all those voice lines of who the scout was, who the spy was, and like their relationships to each other, um, what their backgrounds and sort of origins were. And it was like this incredibly economical way of characterization and storytelling, right? Because, you know, they over time, they, Valve would add more lines, they would reference like in game events, they would reference the TF2 comics. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, in a lot of cases, the storytelling was done outside of Team Fortress 2, which I, I think was really ingenious, actually. You know, they, they not that like that games haven't had comic books and stuff before, but Valve totally committed to integrating writing with design and the events and the rollouts of new stuff. You know, when, um, and again, like if I'm getting cynical, I'm saying like, okay, they were too successful, and that, and that's why loot boxes are a thing today, right? So, w- when you're buying items from, when you're buying Team Fortress Two items, you weren't buying them from Valve, you were buying them from a shirtless Australian man named <laughs> Saxon Hale, 
great character who who's had you know years of history up until this point and his own motivations and he's like really loudmouth and likable and funny and masculine and you're like oh man that's that's like cool and interesting and you know so many i'm surprised like honestly i'm surprised that so many games are still making the mistake of not embedding storytelling and characters into like their their modernization in that way honestly like <laughs> that, that's probably the next stage yeah. it feels like the the whole idea of focusing on characters that to that degree weirdly like shooters didn't take the hint it all went into the moba genre yeah. you know which obviously yeah. has its own influence in in dota of course but i think it took those games for the rest of the industry to be like, oh, people like characters. People want <laughs> characters in their games. And then everything <laughs> became a hero shooter, you know, for the last few years. Yeah. But Overwatch is like was kind of the game that finally looked at TF2 and was like, oh, we can do that. <laughs> Definitely. And, you know, I mean, there's a lot to say about the orange box. Um, you know, TF TF2 is such a huge informative game for me. And, and in fact, Team Fortress Classic that preceded it. And I think what we've ended up with, you know, the game is still going. Uh, we're actually talking about what update it's going to get right now. A lot of fans have been speculating and it's uncertain mm. for this 10 year anniversary. People are expecting stuff. Um, but, but I, I, I think it really taught the industry again, how to, how to tell stories in multiplayer games and that that's like a safe and possible thing to do. And actually it, it allows a game like TF2 to exist for 10 years. You know, how, how many, Shooters from 2007 are we still playing today? Counter Strike is one of them. Uh, uh, CS Source is one of them, but yeah. but very few otherwise. Quake Live, I guess. Um, so, so yeah. yeah. Take take us back, you guys. I want to hear like where where were you when the over the orange box came out oh, and you God. played and you I, played Half Life Two TF Two for the first time. Uh, I remember it was. Uh, it was uh, late summer, and I was like doing a bunch. Of, it was I was in high school. I was like seventeen at the time, and I was you know in the middle of football practice. I hated my fucking life, and uh, uh, I saved up my lawn mowing money, bought this goddamn orange box, and uh, uh, <laughs> like I played Portal through probably about twenty times in that in that month. I don't know, almost every other day, um, and that game has since become like my shining beacon my my you know uh spotlight in in the distance because it's everything i love about video games some kind of mind-bending unheard of mechanic that changes the way you think about consider space or an idea of you know uh, the world and the way things behave and funny writing and uh good graphics (laughs) And, uh, it, and it really, it really messes with your expectations. It really too, does. Right? That, I think that it's last chunk of the uh, game. I, you know, I, I, mm-hmm. I'm, that's when I still had dreams of being a novelist. But uh, it, it changed the way I considered, you know, what how a story could be told. Especially, um, you know, I, I noodled around with games up until that point, but that was like, oh my god, this is a really cool medium. Um, and I'm sure there were other games that demonstrated that before. But now I'm a loser with a portal tattoo on his back and. Uh, but I'm writing about games and I'm loving it. And I'm still playing Portal every other day. Uh, what about you? Where were you guys? Do remember where you were, Evan? I graduated college. I played a lot of TF2 in my parents' basement. Hell yeah. The way, <laughs> the way it was meant to be played. <laughs> yeah. Doing Doritos close at hand. I mean, I, I don't know. I guess I guess the main connection I make is I, I joined PC Gamer in 2008 when TF2 was still really, really big, but, but also like very early. You know, bef- this was pre- crafting pre-items it was like very vanilla quote unquote in that stage and um yeah playing that game competitively ar- around then just like in sort of public online leagues and also playing it with pc gamer readers at pax and and some of the my early colleagues here at pc gamer and, and max pc at, at pax i have like just big fond memories of playing in a LAN tournament there mm. and like bonding with people it was like a really precious moment that like before I know obviously online online gaming existed then, but uh, I don't know. Like skill based matchmaking was not like it was all server browsers in, yeah. in two thousand seven, yeah. two thousand eight. Still, yeah. man, that's like weird to reflect on. <laughs> it's been that long. Anyway, uh, pretty good box. Go read about it on our sites. Yeah, it's still all over the front page. Yeah, it's, it's we have a couple write ups about every. We got our ri- original package. reviews of those games. Yeah, which is pretty cool. Tom, Tom from, Francis reviews. Tom right? Francis, yeah. uh, developer of Gunpoint <clears throat> and Heat Signature. 
uh, reviewed those, and they're pretty great reviews. They, they have a nice through line through them all. So check those out. Um, but in the meantime, I think we're going to kind of wrap up and close with listener questions. So uh, if you have any, get them geared up. Tag us in the chat at PC Gamer. We do have a few. Uh, uh, we do take them from the PC Gamer Club as well. And if you know what the PC Gamer Club is, um, it's... Tell us, James. <laughs> oh, boy. Well, I'll tell you. Yeah, I'm about to turn on my Ron Popeil uh, voice. But, uh, yeah, PC Gamer Club is a uh, it's a club. You can join online if you go to... What's it? Club.pcgamer.com, uh, and it features a uh, you know for like five bucks a month you can uh, join our private Discord, which is where we take those questions and hang out and chat and do a lot of fun stuff. Uh, Wes has a, a quiz bot in there that will suck up all your time. Uh, you get an ad-free experience on the site. You get a uh, digital subscription to the magazine. You get the what's uh, the RPG, the ultimate RPG handbook, yeah. um, digitally and a free game a month. You get. Other like beta keys and whatever else as we get them, we'll just throw them your way. Uh, a couple examples of that are, you know, uh, uh, what's the game? The, the Amazing Eternals. The Amazing Eternals. Uh, got some beta access to that. Mm-hmm. We have like pets in RuneScape. We just, you know, whatever we get, we throw your get way. Get your fire lichen. Get your fire lichen. Get it now. Uh, what a crazy deal. Yeah, it's a crazy, crazy deal. Uh, so get those questions our way. I'll open up with one we got earlier. In the Discord, it's somewhere here. All right, yeah, Buttface Jones, a great regular. He asks, and I don't know if we have any Overwatch authorities here, so this might be falling on dead ears, but do you all think the Overwatch League is going to be successful? Will more publishers start to seek an esports model that closely resembles traditional sports? What do you guys think? I'm I'm not confident. There was actually some financial news this week where Activision, like some... I don't, I'm going to misrepresent this slightly, so apologies. I'm I'm not like an economist, but anyway, Activision stock got downgraded by somebody, like a, a prominent investor or whatever, um, because they're not confident. Uh, th- this particular group is not confident that Overwatch esports are going to be big or as successful as Blizzard thinks it is. And honestly, I don't know. I mean, you look at who is successful in esports right now. You've got Counter Strike, which is remains big even without valve's kind of major participation or uh investment in that scene and then you've got dota 2 and league of legends and who else is really succeeding i mean hearthstone is kind of there on the fringes still kind of pushing along yeah, doing stuff butter, yeah. but you've got a lot of people trying and few people succeeding right or at least like i don't know i don't know what you define success as first of all whether it's like just viewership and audience or a healthy scene um uh, King of the Kill. That's yeah. that's going to be. They just announced that like minimum fifty thousand dollars salaries. I, I think the root of the question here, right? Like, do you think Overwatch is a good spectating experience right now? And I would f- say flatly no. no. Um, you know, I, I enjoy. I think Overwatch has a great s- skill ceiling. It's it's high. Like at the highest level, it's very entertaining to watch. But ultimately, you've got it. You know, the time to kill the variety of roles the the particle effects you know how readable stuff is it's a lot to take in for a newcomer like that's the person you're concerned with when you've got nfl owners investing in these local overwatch teams and all these other like millionaires and billionaires who are buying up these franchises um and and that's that's what activision and blizzard are shooting for right that that tier they, they want to become the next league of legends in terms of esports that's what they're, what they're setting themselves up to do i do think that you know setting up as uh teams mm. that are embedded in cities and the, you know the cities are part of the name of the team and the marketing i think that's one of the best moves yet um but i'm not confident it'll be enough because again it gets down to do people do people love to watch overwatch as much as they love to play overwatch Right now, I don't think that's the case. I, I'm sure Blizzard is really aware of the challenges that they face there. They're not, they're a very smart group of people and very talented group of designers. You know, you look at how reactive Jeff Kaplan and the rest of like the Overwatch, you know, development team has been to feedback and toxicity and like all these, you know, matchmaking, all these issues, skins, you know, the, the way loot boxes work. Like they've addressed <laughs> all this stuff one by one, like in an incredibly admirable, um, an aggressive way and i have no doubt that they'll bring the same kind of work ethic to to this but 
again, you know, look at the issues that Battleground faces. It's like immensely popular, very fun to watch, but huge issues with how spectatable it is. Like, how do you, how do you broadcast a hundred person thing? Um, that's happening in real time and people are dying left and right. How do you showcase that in an interesting way and get good cinematography and explain it to newcomers again? So huge challenges. Yeah. But, so I don't know. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's about as well as we can answer it. I think, uh, Bo would probably say something along the lines of more skins, please. But, uh, <laughs> uh, he's not here to answer. So, uh, Max Ursa asks, what did you guys think of the frontier expo stuff over the weekend? Did you guys pay attention to any of that? Uh, I I wasn't. I didn't too much. I thought they no. they announced like benches for <laughs> <Tight>. <laughs> uh, for roller coaster or uh, excuse me for planet coaster. I did see. Uh, I, I'm not. I'm spacing the name of the game. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh, uh, Jurassic World Evolution. I watched some at least a a reel of in-game footage, um, and it looks very nice uh, for the scale of what I expect that game to be. Um, there was a video that. Uh, Kind of swoops by these, these, you know, different dinosaur pens and shows them up close, and they are all like sort of two scale. Uh, there's a lot of detail in the grass. I mean, it looks very beautiful. Um, what a brilliant use of that engine! Re- exactly. Re- Couldn't be more perfect. I mean, Planet Coaster is gorgeous. So a, a lot of it arises from the art direction itself rather than mm-hmm. the technology, I think. But the technology definitely helps out. So, yeah, I, I need to watch this video that you're referring to because. Honestly, reflecting on this year, I think Planet Coaster is one of the best looking games I've played, just in terms of the enjoyment I get out of just mm-hmm. staring at it. it absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and so I, I have pretty good faith that they can make a uh, an, an interesting dinosaur park. Uh, I, wa- I want to know, though, Sam. and I haven't been able to read our story from Sam, uh, Nearby, who, yeah. is, who is at Frontier Expo, or Andy Kelly, I'm sorry, <laughs> um, up there in the UK. But again, like, how are they how are they handling this sort of success and failure in, in this game because Jurassic Park is a, a series of films about <laughs> hubris and failure of this park, right? So is failure inevitable? Like how do you, how do you win uh Jurassic world evolution? I, I don't know. We'll see. I, I hope need to, I need to dig into that. Yeah. The disaster system, if it exists, there better should, be, you should be able to play it as the dinosaurs. That should be a, an alternate mode, like yeah. the escape from prison architect mode, Ooh. play the dinosaurs just into wreck that shit. Throw some goats on some windshields. Uh, Cool. Uh, so not the most thorough answer, but uh, we're excited about dinosaurs. Uh, Stabby McStab Stab 12 asks, uh, since we're in October, what are your favorite horror games to play around Halloween? And do you find yourself coming back to any just because it's that time of year? Do you guys play any horror games? Are you guys big horror gamers? I mean, Resident Evil 4, it's always yeah. a, a nice yeah. one to, to curl up with and sip some pumpkin spice, whatever. <laughs> Someone, uh, a, a friend loaned me a PlayStation VR um, okay. months ago, which yeah. I have not actually gotten around to playing, but I'm thinking now uh, for ha- around Halloween, I'm going to finally play Resident Evil 7 because yeah. I've had so many people say if, you, if you're not playing it in VR, like, stop. <laughs> Get the <laughs> VR headset, play it in VR. And it's, it's, it's I, a shame that they, they did it as an exclusive right. at least for a year or something. Yeah, but I think, I, on I think the year... Has it been a year since No, it was, no, it was this year. It was like this okay, February, February, March, February, something yeah. like that. Absolutely. So I'm going to try that probably around Halloween, try playing that game in, in VR. I've, I've never played a game that like genuinely scared me before, I don't think. like There are games that have imbued me with a sense of tension, maybe mm. the occasional jump scare where I'm startled for a second, but I, I want that experience of being immersed in a thing that maybe will scare the shit out of me. I don't know. Yeah, I would caveat that by saying just play the first half of it ish. As soon as you stop dealing with the family like the novelty of vr will go away just stop playing it yeah yeah i mean, I mean you can finish the game whatever but like <laughs> after that it sort of becomes a shooter but honestly uh it's the opening moments with uh where you're running from his name jack baker uh in in the house are it's some of the best vr uh, i've ever played because you naturally like without even thinking about i'm like crouched in my room i'm like bending my knees i don't really have to but you know I am, yep. and I'm peeking around a corner, listening to this guy stalk me, and it was just fantastic. You know, it, it, I'm I'm really hoping they finally like bring that to PC, the VR mode. Um, yeah, I, I'd say Resident Evil Seven's a good one. Uh, most games in that series are from campy to a little bit more stark, uh, like the latest one. But uh, 
Probably well, have a go-to. Some Five Nights at Freddy's. Oh, my God. Oh, man. Remember that series? <laughs> wow. Oh, man. Came and went. If you if YouTubers didn't exist, that game would not be big. Wow. Weird. Yeah. Gosh. What, I, what a thing. I'd, I'd throw in Dusk. Uh, this, this is a recent release. Definitely. It's sort of vaguely autumnal. Uh, you know, <laughs> back, backwoods American occult, uh, you know, rednecks that you're fighting. It's all very... October. Yeah, somehow. it's got a very timeless feel, and you know the backpedaling, the shotgun, absolutely, the sound effects, mm, radioactive so crossbow. <laughs> it's a great crossbow. That's a very good crossbow. Uh, well, I think that's about it for questions. Unless there are any more. Well, we do have one queued up here actually, and this is sort of a, a nice one to end on because it's there is no answer. Uh, Throssel asked earlier in the Discord, uh, "Can you talk about uh, when Black Mesa will finally be utterly and completely done?" And what the Black Mesa Doves will do next. And then as like a final question, as if we know this, and the fate of Half-Life 3. Uh, Black Mesa, you guys know what's up with uh, Black Mesa? No. I know uh, they're currently developing the Zen levels, and I know that um, they were delayed. uh, Because it's not necessarily a full-time gig for them. I don't think it is yet. Uh, I'm sure, no. Yeah, (laughs) Yeah, so... Uh, it'll come when it comes, and what will they do after? Probably not. Look on Steam. That's yeah. your... Yeah, the, yeah. Whatever last update <coughs> they posted is as much as we know. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. And uh, Half-Life 3 is coming out 2018. <laughs> I, I mean, I mean, we, 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 got a, we got a big development in, in, the, in, the, in the non-development of Half-Life 3 this year, which is when yeah. Mark, Mark Laidlaw, yeah. right? Yes. The former Valve writer published a sort of... Uh, self-aware cheeky fan fiction like altered fan fiction that laid out essentially the plot and a lot of the script that was planned yeah. a- allegedly for half-life uh, yep. to episode three um i think i mean what what indicates the fate more than that you know a former you know we've had lots of writers leave valve over the past year or two yep. from uh jay pinkerton you know we i my understanding is that um Eric Wolpaw, he's been working on Psychonauts mm-hmm. with uh, oh really with, with Double Fun yeah. Psychonauts That's too. So exciting to he, me. He was working Great. on it while still at Valve, yeah. and I guess there was just nothing to do at Valve. You know, I don't know. He and Chet both left, so yeah. that implies that it was they were ready to move on, do something new. I mean, this connects with our TF2 conversation, honestly, where you had, you know, you have interviews where people like Eric Wolpaw were talking about the writers and the designers who were literally in the same room for Portal. Yeah. Right, they were working together. There's no separation, and how deeply integrated writing was with Valve as a culture and as a studio, yeah. creatively, all their output. You know, TF2, Half Life, C- CS:GO, early days of that to some extent, um, and and kind of where we are now, the era of now, where you've had all these writers leave the studio, and you see what Valve is interested in and focused on. I'm just sort of like correlating these two things, right? They're interested in what VR. They're making three VR games. Yeah. Uh, you know, they're working on hardware and software, integrating that steam OS, um, artifact. Yeah. Steam direct, like steam as a publishing enterprise are interested in that. They're working on artifact, you know, the the game, the games and projects they're invested in right now don't require a lot or like writing lead. Um, Mm -hmm. so until valve gets, and, and that's, that's just a function of what valve kind of as an entity, if you can think about it this way is like curious about, I think Valve really operates on curiosity and, and like what's good for Steam, what's going to be best for Steam. And the PC as a platform, to a big extent, I think we have to credit them for that across the years too. But mm-hmm. until their curiosity and their attention turns back to storytelling or a cool engine thing that we can do that Half-Life 3, Episode 3, whatever, would be perfect for, it's not going to happen. Like that's 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 like the the frame of mind people need to have when thinking about valve thinking about what they're going to do like ask ask yourself like what is valve curious about all you have to do is look at like the interviews that gabe and other folks have done over the past year they've been more transparent more open they've done these amas valve is interested in support like solving their support problem that's been a big conversation point for them this year so this stuff it actually isn't a mystery like you don't have to you don't i know it's i know it's a fun meme and i'm not like being condescending at all it, it is a fun meme mm-hmm to treat half-life to treat episode three is like when's it coming it's it's fun to talk about and play with that it's fun to make fun of it because we all want to play it we'd all love to be in that universe again it's beloved but i flatly think you know 
this stuff isn't a mystery. It's out there. Like you can, you can figure it out. You can put the pieces together. We write about it. Our peers write about it. It's on Reddit. Like it's not hard to find, um, and, and figure out like what is valve doing? Like they've said what they're doing and it's not, it's not half-life. They've, just, been, uh, they've been saying that for a long time a case <laughs> and, of and we've had more and more confirmations of yeah. it. So, uh, again, until that curiosity swings back towards storytelling or Gordon, we're not going to see it. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, be patient uh, or just move on. We'll see. What would a what would a Half Life loot box look like, guys? Oh my God! What you, if got, you, you got uh, the legendary epic gravity gun, a crowbar. You got a buzz saw. Oh, a buzz saw. Oh, God, I got seventeen of those in my shed. Head crab, a purple head crab, or maybe oh, a translucent a, purple head crab where you can see oh, the circuits sick. inside. <laughs> <laughs> oh, jeez. Yo, ma, I got a perp crab. <laughs> the kids and their perp crabs. Check these it days. out. Uh, I think that's going to do it for us this week. But uh, thanks for your questions. Thanks for hanging out and chatting. Uh, remember, you can always catch us here at 1 p.m. every Wednesday, Pacific Time. What is that? 4 EST, Mountain Time. That's 2. We can go down a hole every single time. Wine so time. Want. Wine time. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> really, but, o- really oversold your nature as a, a time zone database. I'm not, James. A, I'm not a time zone expert. I'm sorry, guys. Mm. Uh, but if you want to catch up on the show elsewhere, you can go to youtube.com slash PC gamer. You can catch up on our backlog at uh, PC gamer.com slash tag slash podcast. Uh, you can go to iTunes and subscribe there. Um, or whatever your favorite RSS subscriber is. You can find our RSS feed at on the PC gamer.com as well. Uh, but until next week, yeah. Uh, more more games, more loot boxes to talk about and discuss. Yeah. I'm sure we'll have. So Destiny 2 is around the corner. Yeah. A lot of games coming. Assassin's Creed, yeah. South Park, Evil Within 2. Yep. Uh, 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 so we'll have a lot to talk about in the coming weeks. Yep. And I know somebody on our team is going to be playing Call of Duty World War II, like yes. the, the campaign, pretty yeah. soon. Very I, soon. I, I don't think we even have like an embargo yet, but it's going to be so happening, guys. A lot of stuff over these next few weeks. Stay tuned. Yeah. Stay tuned. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next week. Bye.